This is the Monday, April 18th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, we'll be traveling back in time by rappelling down the steep rock face of New Jersey's Palisades Cliffs, landing at the Alpine Boat Basin, just north of the George Washington Bridge, linking the Garden State to Manhattan. Our destination is listed on the National and New Jersey State Historic Registers as the Blackledge Kearney House. But people who grew up in the area, like myself and our guide, historical interpreter Eric Nelson, simply call it the Kearney House or the Cornwallis Headquarters, based on a local legend that the British general stopped here for a night during the American Revolution when he was chasing George Washington's troops across New Jersey. The oldest part of the Kearney House dates back to the mid-1700s, and in the centuries since, it has been a home, a riverfront tavern, a police station, an inn where people could catch a few Zs, and a shrine to history itself. In our time, the Kearney House brings to life the Hudson River and the people who relied on it as a lifeline to the metropolis downriver, as well as upstate New York and the Erie Canal. You can tour the Kearney House for free, May through October, and also enjoy special events such as its punch and pie tavern nights and tales of the macabre with readings from former area resident Edgar Allan Poe. You can check out these and other one-of-a-kind nights at njpalisades.org slash tavern. In addition to his work at the park, Eric is co-author of the book New Jersey's Palisades Interstate Park and the director of a documentary, A New Deal for the Palisades. You can keep track of what's happening at the Kearney House on social media by liking their Facebook page or following at Palisades Parks on Twitter. And this really is an interstate park that we're visiting, meaning it straddles both New York and New Jersey. It was formed by Governors Theodore Roosevelt of New York and Foster M. Voorhees of New Jersey in 1900. They wanted to protect these majestic cliffs from destruction by quarry operators during the Gilded Age. Thanks to their efforts and those of generations since, the park today is there for us to enjoy with 100,000 acres stretching over 20 miles of the Hudson River shoreline. It really is a hidden gem so close to New York City. Okay, now that we've reached the bottom of the cliffs at the lip of the Hudson River and we're looking out at all those beautiful boats, Let's knock on the door of the Kearney House and see what historic treasures Eric Nelson has in store for us. I'm here at the lip of the Hudson River in the Palisades Interstate Park at the Alpine, New Jersey Boat Basin. We are just outside the historic Kearney House, and my guest is Eric Nelson, a historical interpreter here. Thank you for welcoming the history author into the past, Eric. Thank you for having us. Let's start off with the spelling and the pronunciation of the house, because you had an interesting anecdote about how you tracked down that historical detail. It's spelled K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. How did you track down how you pronounce that? Like so many things, it is basically guesswork or educated guesswork. In examining census records from when people were living here, which has been a big source of how we've put together information We noticed on several occasions when the census taker came and spoke to members of the family and wrote down their name, the census taker actually spelled it C-U-R-N-E-E, Kearney. So that's how it sounded to the census taker. So it seems a a fair surmisal that the family themselves may have pronounced it close to that, Kearney. The house is not open yet for the season, but you're going to start that 
shortly, by the time people hear this, certainly they can start thinking about visiting. But let's paint a picture of what they find when they step through that door into the house. It's just a few feet away from us right here. Visitors come and they're transported back into the past. It felt very much like that when I stepped through. So describe some of the artifacts you have in there. One of the challenges when you're dealing with a house of this age and trying to tell its story is actually narrowing it down because you have a couple of centuries to choose from. So you have to make choices along the way. And pretty early on that we settled that the time period we want to bring people to would be the mid-19th century, say around 1850, give or take a decade, to that period. And the reason for that is it's a time period that we know a fair amount about with this house. I mean, the house, to the best of our knowledge, was already here at the time of the Revolution, but we don't know very much about who was living here and what was going on down here. Whereas when we get to the mid-1800s, we do have quite a bit of information about specifically who was living here, who the neighbors were, what was going on here. And it's a fascinating dynamic time period for this area, for life along the river here. This was kind of the boom years for these settlements underneath the Palisades, when the stone quarrying business was in full swing and these little farm landings, such as this one, which was called Closter Landing at the time, were just thriving little communities where farmers from inland were bringing their farm goods. We've seen accounts where as many as 40 farm wagons a day would have been coming down to the docks here to load onto wooden sailing vessels so that farm goods could be shipped down to New York City. I mean, this was a time period where New Jersey's nickname, the Garden State, actually made sense. We really were the garden for New York City and for Philadelphia in the southern part of the state. So that's the time period we want to transport people to. Now, people can hear in the background there are some geese flying overhead. They were kind enough to add a little color. Some of them were a little shy before, right? They didn't want to speak to us. But And there's a waterfall in the background that you may be able to hear a little bit of. So this is a real functioning part of the Palisades Interstate Park, not far at all from New York City. And I mentioned that a couple of times in the intro, and I'm sure I will a couple of times today, because you're looking right across at Yonkers, New York, and it's not a place where you would expect to find a place almost unchanged. I mean, there's picnic tables and there's some infrastructure, and but there's still stone buildings and there's still this house that is from, well, half of it is from when was the original building? Sometime in the 1760s. Like so much that, again, is educated conjecture. But it seems like sometime in the mid-1760s, the house was originally built and then added on to in the next century. And the Hudson River, I said to you earlier that it's nice to meet somebody who still thinks of it as the North River <laughs> occasionally, which people used to call it. And you'll see that in a lot of the old maps of New York City, which makes sense, I guess. They have the East River right across the way. When you come here, you're thinking about the past, you're looking at some of the signs. But for you, there's a personal connection, as there is for myself growing up in this area. So how did you become interested in the Palisades, this great cliff wall that we have behind us? Well. You know, some of my earliest memories are associated with this park. My family, when I was a little boy, we actually came to this very picnic area for picnics and went exploring around the area. One of my father's best friends, we called him Uncle Fred. He, you know, one of those, he wasn't really an uncle, but he was an uncle to us. Kept a little boat down here at Alpine Boat Basin and he used to take my brother and me and my father out for day trips on it. So I, I've known this area since some of those earliest days. And then when I was in Boy Scouts, we used to go hiking in the park here, as scouts still do on any any weekend day. You see troops of scouts coming through. So I, I had really known the place from very early on. Along the way, I got a part-time job here, a seasonal position helping with clearing the trails and doing work like that. And just started noticing some of the old foundations, the old stone jetties going in the river, and it sparked my curiosity. And I started asking questions. And next thing you knew, I was starting to lead hiking tours in the park based on artifacts and history of the park. And somehow this has ended up being a career for me, a happy accident of my life. 
The first chapter of your book, New Jersey's Palisades Interstate Park, is titled Rocks That Look Like Trees. These huge cliff walls that you and I grew up looking at and being so impressed with and hiking on when you're a Boy Scout is fun. You wouldn't think it was now. Now I don't like the idea of having to drag my butt up that cliff wall, but we would go places like this. It really is a treasure. What was this area like when the Native Americans gave them that name? Well, I think the strand that runs through all of these time periods, of course, is the river itself. And often the key to bringing any of these time periods into mind and making them come alive for you is to begin with the river and to realize for the Native American people who lived here, the river was also a important meeting place and food source and, and, and all of that. So as near as we can tell, there weren't permanent settlements of Native Americans. It would have been the Lenape tribe in this area right along the river here at the base of the cliffs. But we do have ample evidence of them coming here and setting up seasonal encampments. For example, not a half a mile away from us, you can find oyster shells buried into the hillside that go back to Native American encampment along the river. So the tribes had their permanent villages inland from here, but they would have come to the river to trade with other tribes to fish for fish and oysters and, and all of that. Back to the house when we have the second people, I guess, Lene Lenape, our local Native Americans, the naming's the first people. When the first European settlers get here and when this first house is built, that's James and Rachel Kearney. We have a picture of her. It's really cool, for lack of a better word, to see her all around. So when did they build the house and when did they first move into it? Tell us their story. The house was already built when James and Rachel got on the scene here. The house was most likely built by a family named Van Skyver. The property was owned by a farmer who had a few hundred acres, and he and his neighbors wanted to establish a river dock here so that they could ship their farm goods down to New York City. And we believe they hired the Van Skyvers, essentially, to operate the dock here, to be dock master here and built the house. That would probably be in the 1760s, because 1761 is the year we have a record of them building an improved farm road down here. So we figured the house was built shortly thereafter. James and Rachel Carney moved here when they married. For her, it was a second marriage. Her first husband had died, leaving her with three children that she was raising. And so she remarried in 1817, and then moved down here to this little house. At that point, her first father-in-law actually owned the property and the house. So she and her second husband, James Kearney, were essentially renting the house from her former father-in-law. And then a few years later, they bought the property from him and continued to raise their own family here. They had five of their own children. So she came here with three from the first husband, had at least five more and then adopted at least one daughter besides. So that's at least nine children that we know of that she brought up in this little house here. She seems like a tough, sturdy lady. You hear that often about women back then, and men for that matter, I guess, that people were either really super frail or super tough. So James Kearney, speaking of frailty and the many diseases that could take you back in those days, he dies in 1831 when Andrew Jackson is the president of the United States. Rachel opens the house to boat and fishermen, some of those oystermen maybe that you were just talking about, oysters being a huge industry in New York City down the Hudson. She needs to feed those nine children. And I always remind people when you say a tavern in those days, it's not like today where they're going to be having karaoke and <laughs> <laughs> trivia nights on Thursdays and things like that. Opening it as a tavern really would mean an inn. Those are the only places you could stay. They were the sort of meeting places of the revolution. Yes. You know, to come back to James Corney quickly, just to give him his due, about a month before he died, 
he prepared his will, and his will states to the effect, I, James Kearney, being sound of mind but weak of body. So this was a man who basically knew he was dying, and what he was afflicted with, I mean, I could make a guess, and that guess would probably be tuberculosis, but as I seem to take so many of these boatmen of consumption, as they called it back then, again, that's basically just a guess. But he died. Now, Rachel Kearney... She's a widow the second time at that point. She's about 50 years old, too. She still has young children with her. She still has children who are not yet 10 years old. She was having children with James Carney into her 40s. And at that point, here she is, 50 years old, on her own down here. And yes, we think she's basically opened her house at that point to be a tavern. As you said, a tavern, I think the best way to see it today is an inn, a place where you could certainly get something to drink. You could wet your whistle there, I'm sure. But a tavern would have also implied food and even lodging. But particularly, again, come back to the river, I always say, to understand the time period. I mean, and imagine now that you're a boatman and you've just come up from New York City. It might be a cold day like it is today, and you've been fighting the wind and the tides and working this boat up the river, chilled to the bone. You finally get tied up here at close to landing, have the boat tied up and secured, and everything's done. And you walk into Mrs. Carney's tavern, and it's like you just walked into paradise. There's a warm fire going, a mug of cider, a pot of stew over the hearth, and Guys from other boats are coming in there. Everybody's laughing and telling stories about how cold it was on the river. And did you hear the latest one? Did you hear what President Jackson did or or what have you? And somebody's saying, somebody picks up an instrument, people are singing. And it's just that long, cold day on the river becomes a lot easier to take at that point. You can still see those fireplaces here, by the way. Still warm yourself by them. And if you bring your own beer or what would they have drank back then? Cider? Oh, beer and cider and wine, all of that. <laughs> yeah, when you have your tavern nights, don't come down here, you know, just any time you feel like it. Eric does not want to find you in the house, no. uh, passed out. <laughs> but you can have that same experience, and what a connection to the past. And it's a treat to stand at the door of the Kearney House just for a moment. I, I did that here. I do that at Historic Houses where you just take that moment to say, this is literally stepping back into the past. I always use a bunch of time machine references. This is literally it, because if you were a person back then coming off that boat, that would be the experience you had, and you can't experience that many places. We're looking across, I'm watching the Metro North train come down from Yonkers and Westchester and just go through. There's high rises over there, but they look over, and thanks to the preservation efforts of Theodore Roosevelt and others, during the Gilded Age when they were mining, but because they preserved it, this house still stands here, and it's unchanged from those colonial days inside. You get that taste of early America. You also do nights where you have music here or period readings. This is all great stuff that you can still experience right here, Alpine, New Jersey, not far at all from the George Washington Bridge from Manhattan if you're visiting the city and have a hankering for some of our colonial history. If you turn slightly to the right, you see New York City skyscrapers in the distance on a clear day, which this unfortunately is not. Let's see. Can we see? No. But <laughs> it seems impossible that this house is still here, especially right on top of a tidal river. So how did this place survive three centuries? And I'm thinking of Superstorm Sandy that gave us a big, huge wall of water here. How did the house remain standing? Well, even before Sandy, we used to sometimes kind of kid around saying it's extraordinary, you know, but through the centuries, you've had enormous mansions on top of the Palisades, and you've had, right where we're sitting now, in fact, there was a big oatmeal mill in the late 1800s, a steam-powered mill that made oatmeal and barley and so on, and that's all gone, and this one little house just keeps toughing it out. It's had uh, rock slides with big rocks slamming into it. It's just kind of a tough little survivor, which it really proved itself in Sandy, because that was one of the most heartbreaking things I've seen in my time working here. Where we're sitting right now having this conversation, we would have been underwater fighting for our lives at the point of high tide during Sandy. Four or five feet of water came up from the river, 
driven by wind and carrying all kinds of debris and and everything and just flooded the downstairs of the house. I think the best way to describe the storm surge from Sandy, it was like a little tidal wave that came up the river. I mean, it put the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel underwater and just kept coming up the river relentlessly. And when it got here, it just careened into the house, filled the house downstairs. And then as it continued up the river and the water level dropped here, the receding water dragged a big part of the stone wall with it, left a gaping hole in the front of the house. And this is a stone wall that's 250 years old, a foot and a half thick. It was just toppled like a toy. But the amazing thing is the house stayed standing. Even with one whole wall knocked down, that incredible pencil strength that it has for how it was constructed kept it standing. And within 48 hours, our carpenters on staff in the park here got in there and put some temporary framing up and sealed it up so that it would be secure. And over the next two years, we rebuilt. We got found some very talented stonemasons. I'll give them a shout out. Yankee Construction came down from Rockland County and rebuilt the stone walls. And then our own crews rebuilt all the wooden section of the house and also did an amazing job and it's just such a joy to have it back again they went so far to keep it historically accurate if people do come here to the kearney house just put your hand there on the wall and the mortar and you tried to replicate the mortar or your masons did yankee construction did you say their name yes, was yes, they yeah. went to the river they they tested it first to see what it was and they these are all the original boulders and that simple thing about touching the wall that's so important to me in history and a lot of these houses understandably there are velvet ropes and there's lucite on the floor and you can't really get in there and touch the things. And so when you can come to a place where you really can touch them, that's really special. Instead of feeling like you're in the future looking back at the past, it's almost no better than a photograph in some ways. But if you can come to a place where you can experience it and sit and have your meal and listen to music and kind of relax, you can really open your eyes and try to feel like you're back in that past that you can't visit any other way, really. Well, that's really true, Dean. And something we're very proud of here, and I have to thank our superintendent and the administration of the park who's been so supportive and so forward thinking on it. But we've been able to not just present the house, like you were saying, like it was a photograph you're going to, but to actually use the house. Back in the early 2000s, we got the fireplaces restored so that they're actually working. That was a game changer for me. I'd already been working with the house for six or seven years at that point. And I'd been telling people, oh, yes, Mrs. Carney kept the tavern here. And, you know, part of me almost didn't believe what I was saying because it was just this kind of cold, sort of sterile house. It had its charm. It was kind of hard to picture. And then we got these fireplaces working. We had them going, and we started doing a little bit of cooking down here, and it really transformed the house. And all of a sudden, the house became a living thing. And I think... That's something that the people who work with me here, I have some young people who've worked with me over the years. And when we interpret the house, especially one of these tavern nights, we're not just showing, we're actually using the house. We call these tavern nights punch and pie. We get some pies from a farm market that we serve. And when we serve a punch, which is basically a wine with some spices in it that we heat up, we cook the alcohol out of it. But Ooh. but we, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's why you can bring your own beer or wine if you want. We can't serve it to you, though. That's That involves another <laughs> set of rules that we can't veto here. But when we heat that punch up, we're... We're heating it over our fire. And more than that, we put a big kettle, it's about a gallon and a half of water, over that kettle right at the start and heat it up and we keep it warm and we refill it when we need to. And that's our dish water. And that at the end of the night, when we're washing the dishes, as you're getting ready to leave and you see you see us there in our period clothing. We say we like to party like it's 1849 down here. We're dressed in our period clothing and so on. And we're washing the dishes. That is water that we heated up over our fire that we're now using to wash the dishes. And it, it really, I think for the kids, I'll call them kids, the young people who work with me and help me do these programs. I mean, They've cooked here, they've cooked and eaten the food that we've made here and so on. So they take a kind of ownership of it and have a sense of it that 
I think is really kind of special compared to a lot of historic sites where you have to have, and I understand not every site could do what we do, but and you have to have kind of a hands-off approach to it. But here, we're actually using the house. We're not just showing it. We're using and we're using it in some of the same ways Mrs. Carney did. We're letting people come in and serve them and entertain them and give them a warm spot to warm their hands and laugh and, and enjoy a song or two. You love the fireplaces and you love entertaining here because you said to me twice, as if you live here, of course you don't, but apologetically that you wish you could have had a fire going for me. And I <laughs> I was very tough and said, oh, no, that's fine. You know, very polite, I guess. Uh, I was raised right. Thanks, Mom. But then I've been sitting here and I said, you know, that the fire's been in the back of my mind. And I can see just looking at those fireplaces is clearly not enough. And just to remind people, we are speaking with author and historic interpreter Eric Nelson in the historic Kearney House at the Alpine Boat Basin in Palisades Interstate Park, just up the river from Manhattan. This spring, I hope you'll come and journey to another day and age, and you can enjoy a pint or glass of wine while doing so. This is an authentic Riverside Tavern. It was a dockmaster's house. It was so many things through its long history, and today it's an inspiration. So you can get the details about it at njpalisades.org slash tavern. And you can see some of those pictures, by the way, of the Sandy Reconstruction. You were talking about people that come here, hikers, bikers, both will come down here, not just people that are on boats. You can access it on your bike or by hiking down if you're physically fit. And using the house, you talk about using the house, not just having it be someplace that's behind Lucite. And you learn about the history of the house when you do that. I read one of the articles and they were saying they hung all the spoons just over the fireplace because they looked cool there. But then you started using them and you say, well, that's not how they would have done it. That's or right. the, or the, <laughs> um, the low ceilings. This is something people always note. People always say, well, it's because people were smaller back then. And certainly when I've gone to medieval castles in Ireland and Britain, I do notice that because I'm six, three. So I'm always ducking and trying to keep my feet on those little stairs. But you realize something else about that. People weren't that much shorter. These are very low ceilings. People weren't three or four feet shorter. Right. It's because when you go out and chop this firewood, you realize, wow, you wanted to save as much heat as you could because that's hard labor to be doing. And so that's one of the reasons that the ceiling is low, correct? That's absolutely correct. It's just much more efficient to heat it. As a living space, the low ceilings just make it so much more efficient and easier to manage. Again, think of the river, I keep saying, but imagine now it's February and we're having one of those really cold winters that we occasionally get, and the river has frozen over, especially early on in the early days of this house. I mean, you'd be on your own down here and to be staying warm. It's literally a matter of survival to be able to heat the house. And so those low ceilings make a big difference. And, you know, there certainly were people, even in the 18th century, who were your height and taller, who would have learned to duck their heads when they went in many houses of the time. Just the anecdote, I had a, a gentleman working with me one summer who was, I guess, your height, 6'3", or maybe even a little taller. And he used to always joke that he wanted us to rename the house to the Ow Damn It House because he found <laughs> he was saying that every time he worked down here. It's important to wear a hat. I was looking at you. And you have a nice <laughs> Palisades Interstate Park Commission hat. That's uh, that's good branding. He wanted to make sure I saw it, uh, even though he knew it was radio. But uh, yeah, I'm wearing my Rutgers hat because I felt I should wear something New Jersey appropriate here from my alma mater. Yeah, it does, it does help when you bang into the beams. But I mean, honestly, the vast majority of people today who come in and say, oh, look how low the ceilings are, most of them aren't banging their heads in the house here. It's a comfortable height for most people who come in it. It's just by modern standards, the house seems small, the ceilings seem low, and so on. But our standards have changed quite a bit in the past century or so. Those are poplar what are the beams? Uh, tulip poplar. Tulip, tulip, tulip poplar, trees, right. basically, okay. are the big, heavy beams that you'll notice in the older section of the house has these kind of massive beams that are uh, tulip tree beams. And that's a big tip-off when you look at the newer section 
I'm talking about these sections. I mean, each one is only two rooms, one above the other. So you have the original house, which was two rooms, downstairs, upstairs room, and then an attic above it. An addition was added, most likely when they started keeping a tavern here. So that would have been in, you know, maybe the 1840s or so. And when you look at those beams, they're from a sawmill. They're cut. They're lumber, essentially. Whereas when you look in the old section of the house, they're trees. They've been squared off with hand tools and so on. But you can see very clearly that these are trees that were shaped to hold the house up. Speaking of when your visiting season begins, the first of those events are the evenings of April 23rd and 30th of 2016. But you have events all through the spring and summer. You talked a little bit about what some of the other ones are, the way that you not only preserve history, but let people really participate in it. There's one story that I bet you wish was true because it does add a lot to the house. But even though it was false, it's one of the reasons the house was preserved and not raised like that oatmeal factory and so many other things around here. And it was the local legend. Now we know it's just a legend that General Charles Cornwallis spent a night here at the Kearney House in 1776. The... British had to scale the Palisades to drag their cannons up there and catch Washington. And whenever I look at the Palisades, I always think of those poor British soldiers having to come all the way across the ocean and then, okay, boys, drag it up here. So that was a tough, tough job to have. And if you go to close to New Jersey, by the way, we said uh, this is the Closter Landing, you will still see the seal is the Closter Rider, which is a little boy or girl. I guess they don't know who exactly it was, but saw the British coming, and they say road down there, another sort of legend. But yeah, tell us I hate the, to tell you that but that's a legend, too. That, well, this brings <laughs> us right back to Cornwallis, because this is probably the only time I've ever heard of bad history leading to the preservation of good history. Not that it was bad. There's nothing bad about the story that the kid doesn't do anything bad. But these stories were legends for a long time, and it's nice to be able to debunk a myth, even one so dearly held as these two. But have at it. Did the only general who surrendered to both George Washington and Napoleon ever sleep here? No, we're pretty sure he didn't. And probably if he was here, which we're pretty sure he wasn't, I don't think he would have gotten much sleep that night because he had an army of 5,000 men who were crossing the river, basically doing an amphibious landing and, as you said, ascending the cliffs. I mean, not straight up the cliffs, obviously, but up one of the farm roads that Again, you know, from colonial times, the farmers who settled in Bergen County were looking for routes to New York City. And so with the Palisades as this very obvious obstacle, they found natural gaps in the cliffs where Indian trails had been in the past. And they built wagon roads on on these very steep, crude roads to get down to the Hudson River, the North River to uh, ship their goods to New York City. And the British, when they crossed the river with the intent of capturing Fort Lee, which they certainly did that day, they used one of these farm landing roads, one of these wagon roads, very steep, crude road that they had to ascend and, as you said, drag cannons with them and so on. And when the Park Commission was created in 1900 and they bought this little piece of property that the Kearney House is on in 1907, the story that went with the house was that this farm landing, what became known as Alpine Landing in our day and age, that this farm landing was where General Cornwallis landed. This is where his 5,000 men hiked up the Palisades and their march to Fort Lee. And the Park Commission took that at face value and... When it came time to decide what to do with this house, they used it as a park police station for a while, like a ranger station, essentially. And when they didn't need it for that purpose anymore, you know, there's talk, should we tear it down? They had torn down dozens of other houses uh, around here. But there was a public opposition to it because of the story that it had been Cornwallis's headquarters. Opposition in particular from the New Jersey State Federation of Women's Clubs the group that was so instrumental in creating the park in the first place, said, no, this should be preserved as a historic shrine because General Cornwallis stayed here. And so the park agreed. They preserved it. They hung a plaque on it, proclaiming it the Cornwallis headquarters. They sent out some press releases. One kind of makes me chuckle. They said, this will be the nation's only historic shrine dedicated to an enemy general. And um, the women's clubs all pitched in and took up a collection across the state of antique furniture 
And most of the antique furniture that's in the house today was donated then in the 1930s by women's clubs all across the state to help furnish this Cornwallis headquarters and all well and good. And when I was a little boy coming here with my father, I can remember at that point, this house was just kept locked up. I'm talking in the 1960s, early 1970s, the house had been locked up for decades. They weren't opening it to the public anymore. But the plaque was there. And I remember my father explaining the Cornwallis story to me and trying to peer in the little windows in the door and see what was inside the house. That makes a strange metaphor for what my adult career has has become, maybe. Still peering into that house, trying to figure out what's in there. But in any event, that was the story. Enter a man named John Spring, who only just passed just last year. He was 98 years old then. In the 1960s, John Spring was the historian for the borough of Creskill. And he started doing research, and to make a long story short, he basically figured out that Cornwallis did not use this as his landing point. There was another landing point about a mile and a half south of here, which became known later as Hyler's Landing. It's just a hiking trail today. There's no boat base in there and so on. But John Spring came to realize that that was actually where General Cornwallis landed. And and he saw that in all of the 1800 sources, they all pointed to that as the site where he landed. And <laughs> well, he didn't know what he was getting into, though, when he made his findings public. A lot of people were very upset because this was the Cornwallis headquarters. You know, how can you say? How dare you? <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> and especially because that was right when the bicentennial was happening. 1976. You know? Yeah, 1976, there was like all this excitement about it. And they were going to reenact all these events. They were going to reenact <laughs> the British Army. And now all of a sudden, he was telling them that they were going to reenact it in the wrong place. <laughs> so there was kind of a little local history dust up over that. But at the end of the day, when the dust settled, pretty much the overwhelming consensus among local historians and the County Historical Society and everyone else is that John Spring got it right, and that somehow this little bit of local folklore had come up about Cornwallis landing here and this being his headquarters. And so we had this <laughs> situation now. We had this house that was preserved as Cornwallis's headquarters, but it wasn't. <laughs> but it was preserved. And so that it's a beautiful thing, really. And what John Spring did without ever intending to, but he forced us to look at this house with fresh eyes and say, well, we have this house. It's not Cornwallis's headquarters, so what is it? And that led us to this amazing story of this extraordinary woman, Rachel Kearney, and the life she lived here. And it's helped us also understand that this house was part of a vibrant community in the 19th century. Probably at the time of the Revolution, it may have been the only house down here. But by the time Mrs. Kearney was keeping her tavern here, there was a whole community based around the docks and the road going up the Palisades. And we've been able to just have so many adventures learning about the house, the Kearney family, and the other families that lived down here, and just how vital and important the Hudson River was to the life of the young nation in the in the 1800s, how this river linked all the way to the Great Lakes via the Erie Canal. Yeah, New York Harbor all the way to the interior of the continent was connected by this river. We've spent I don't know, a good hour here in the past, so I guess it's time to get back to the present and our iPhones and iPads, which, by the way, there is no electrical power in the house. So I would tell people if you're planning to jump in and charge your phone, you can't do that inside. That's very much the period. Although we do feel a world and centuries away from New York City, we're right here in the thick of it. So make your pitch to busy modern people in the future in 2016. Why should they take the time to come back and see Rachel Kearney's house, learn her story, and spend some time with your fireplaces? You'll get to take a little ride on a time machine, and you'll get to see an aspect of this country's past and ponder it. Your life will be a little bit richer for it. Well, author and historical interpreter Eric Nelson, thank you for taking the time to welcome us into the Kearney House. Again, just north of New York City, at the very lip of the Hudson or North River, as we call it. I'm going to continue calling it that for probably forever, just in honor of all the people who used to live here, Native American and colonists alike. Best of luck in the spring, and I'll see you again for Tavern Night. 
Thank you, Dean. Thanks for coming down. Well, here I am, back at Radio City Music Hall on 6th Avenue and the present, or at least as in the present as I get. Oh, and check out what's happening at the Kearney House and the Palisades Interstate Park's other historic sites by visiting njpalisades.org, liking their Facebook page, or following at Palisades Parks on Twitter. You can find the Amazon link to purchase Eric's book, New Jersey's Palisades Interstate Park, at our website, historyauthor.com. We get a small portion of every purchase you make at Amazon.com whenever you click through that banner on our homepage, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can even bookmark that URL if you like. And remember, let us know what you think of the park and the interview on Twitter at HistoryDean or at Facebook.com slash HistoryAuthor. And by the way, when you go to see the Kearney House, make sure you take a close look at that giant boulder that's sitting not far from the house. It fell in 1896. It could easily have crushed it. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll pop in next Monday for our all-new interview, or come back for Classical Wisdom Wednesday and History in Five Friday. And remember, if you do subscribe on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until then, happy reading, everybody. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.